Well, ladies and gentlemen, hello again. Welcome to another Reflected Reality Simulations video. My name is Graham, this is X-Plane 11 and the Hot Start TBM 900. It's been almost two years since my last video, but I've had this aircraft since it was released back at the end of 2018. I've had a lot of fun flying it and it was always my intention to do a detailed video series uh, with this aircraft because I, I really enjoy it. It's, it's very, very well done. Unfortunately, life got just a little bit busy and I quite simply didn't have the spare time to do flight simulation really at all or YouTube videos. In the first part of 2020 though, the world has changed quite considerably and I find myself with a lot more spare time than I could have bargained for. I'm hoping that's just a temporary situation. If you have been caught up in the coronavirus pandemic, either directly or indirectly, uh, I think it's just important to say, stay strong, stay positive, and hopefully in the not too distant future, the world will hopefully return to what we once considered to be normal. But let's not dwell on that. Let's have a look at this lovely TBM 900 model. Now, if you were to ask most other uh, add-on developers to produce a model like this of a single engine general aviation turboprop, You'd probably have a very nice 3D model. You'd maybe have some custom sounds, uh, maybe some slide out panels and some stock flight dynamics and default systems. But that's not the case with this model. Quite simply, the level of systems modeling, especially the engine modeling, are about the most detailed I've ever seen in a flight simulator. The attention to detail and the quality of this product are amazing. The 3D modeling is exceptional. The system simulation is exceptional. So this is part one of a six part video series and I'm going to try and look at everything that you'd possibly want to do with this aircraft in a flight simulator. We're going to look at startups both with the onboard battery and the ground power unit. We'll look at IFR and VFR procedures. We'll fly it around the traffic pattern. We'll take it to grass field We'll look at flight in icing conditions. We'll look at diversion procedures and go arounds. Today, in part one, we're at Glasgow Airport and we're going to fly an IFR departure out towards the northeast and on towards Aberdeen. And then part two of the video series will continue to uh, arrive into Aberdeen and shut down the aircraft on the ground. So between parts one and two, you've got the key elements of uh, conducting a full flight in the TVM 900. Let's jump inside and have a look. So firstly, I mentioned attention to detail. If I have a look over here on the hour meter on the aircraft, nothing complicated about the hour meter. When I loaded up this as a new aircraft, I based it in Glasgow and it showed about six hours on the hour meter. If I was to load it in southern France, it would have less hours than that because when you create a new model, it takes a guess at the approximate number of hours would be required to ferry the aircraft from Tarbes in France, where it was produced, to where you start off with it. And that's something that didn't need to be there, and if it wasn't there, nobody would have noticed. But it just shows the attention to detail that's gone into this product. So, to set the aircraft up, it's really quite straightforward. If you look at the, the real documentation for the TBM 900, which is available online, it can be quite wordy. It doesn't highlight the fact that there's actually fairly simple procedure flows to follow to set the aircraft up. But firstly, before we do anything else, we need to double check that the parking brake has been set. The parking brake's a bit unusual that we need to hold the uh, brake pedals and then apply the parking brake to make sure the brake pressure is trapped in the lines there. Once we've done that, we can set about preparing the aircraft. So, we've got a lovely slide out payload manager here. I can use that to take the covers off the front, the static wick protectors off, the pitot covers off, and the static port covers. We can open the doors, and we can open the uh, cargo hold at the front, the little cargo bay there. We can take the chocks in and out. We need to put some fuel in the aircraft first of all. Again, here's some more attention to detail. If I open the fuel cap on the left hand side, the fuel uh, filler cap 
comes off. And as I put fuel in, you'll see the left wing of the aircraft dip as the weight is applied to the tanks. Now if I close that window and go flying, it's going to leave the fuel filler off and it's going to lose fuel in flight because I've not put the cap back on correctly. So we need to remember always to close the fuel filler. And it's exactly the same on the other side. Let's open it up, put the fuel in, and then close the cap. We need some payload as well. It always starts off with just a pilot. So I'll put a co-pilot in. I'll put a rear seat passenger. We're just the weight, just a little bit. I'll put some cargo in the back, about 60 kilos, sounds reasonable, and maybe a little bit in the front, maybe some uh, aircraft spares, maybe some consumables for the aircraft, that sort of thing. Once we've done that, we'll uh, close the main door and close the front, uh, front cargo door. It gives you the uh, weight and balance chart here. It shows me that uh, my takeoff weight is going to be around about uh, 3.2 tons, so under max takeoff weight. If I have a look at the fuel as well, I see when I put the fuel up to landing fuel of 280 US gallons, it tells me it's going to be over the max landing weight. As I click that down, you can see that once I've burnt off 26 gallons of fuel, it'll be under the max landing weight. So that's perfect for the flight up to Aberdeen today. So we've taken the covers off the outside. We've still got the chocks in. What I'm going to do is connect the ground power unit. See there's a $50 charge for the first hour on the ground power unit. It's also very noisy, so I'm going to close the door so we don't have to listen to it. Now before we start the aircraft up, we've got to do just a few checks on it. And as I said, if you read the checklist in the uh, real aircraft documentation, it seems quite wordy and involved. But to be quite honest, we're just going to go top to bottom and left to right. So firstly, passenger oxygen. That has to be selected off. And then we'll put the flight crew oxygen on. And we can test the masks. We can actually wear the masks in this model. I've never ever seen that on a flight simulator before, but it's just another fantastic immersion factor. So top to bottom, left to right. The overhead panel is straightforward. We want to make sure everything but the ignition is selected off. So the external lights are off, the panel lights are off, the internal lights are off. This is the crash bar, it's called here. We'll make sure that's down. Starter's off, ignition's auto, that's fine. Auxiliary boost pump is off, fuel selector manual, and the trims are off. Straightforward. Onto the main panel now. Circuit breaker light is off. The mask microphone selector is guarded, so it's on microphone. On the de-icing system, everything is selected off. We've already recycled the parking brake, so that's fine. From here, we'll come down onto the pedestal, make sure that the uh, manual override for the power is back, fully back. Make sure the power lever is in the cutoff position. We must not move the power lever uh, with the engine shut off. Make sure the flaps are in the up position and we'll change the fuel selector so that we've got one of the tanks selected. Coming back up here now, make sure air conditioning is off, bleed is off reset, pressurization mode is auto and the dump uh, switch is guarded. Make sure the hot air flow is fully to the right. And just behind the uh, right hand yoke, make sure the alternate static source is pushed in, the ram air is pushed in, make sure all the circuit breakers are in and finally on the floor make sure that the uh, actuating handle and the selector for the emergency gear extension are in the stowed position in the in the load position and with that we're able to apply power to the aircraft so straightforward top to bottom left to right to apply power i'm going to take the crash bar and put it into the up position not touching the electrical source and not touching the generator and you'll see that having moved the crash bar, we get the uh, standby display and the primary flight display. That's because they're on the battery bus and that crash bar simply connects the battery to the battery bus. So these devices here, which be your devices of last resort, if you like, once all the other electrical sources have gone, you still have these available. We've got the ground power unit connected. So what I can do is connect the ground power to the aircraft. I'm going to take the source selector and click it up to GPU 
and I'll also put the generator on main. I'm going to cancel the cautions Moral caused by warning. that. Okay. It's a very, uh, it's not noisy, it, it, it's very keen on uh, flashing the master warning and the master caution, especially during startup. So I've got keystrokes bound to those just to help cancel those. So GPU is selected on the source and main generator is uh, ready for use. That's the overhead panel, mostly All set up. Okay. Let's just acknowledge the uh, screen on the multifunction display and let's do a lights check as well. So make sure all the aircraft lights work, we get the audio tones, I'll make sure the two landing gear test buttons work and then we'll just have a quick check on the uh, multifunction display. So we've got the fuel on board that we expected, oxygen pressure is fine and ITT, which will be important during the start, is nice and cool. We should double check the fuel system as well. So system and fuel, and make sure that the fuel remaining is the same. Now in the simulator, this should always be the same, but on the real G1000 fit, uh, this figure here is usually provided by a totalizer, which measures fuel flow. So you've got to set this to be the correct value. So this is measured and this is counted essentially. But the sim takes care of that today. So having done that, we would be in a position where we could start the engine. Um, what I don't want to do is to run the battery flat. But because I've got the GPU, you see the GPU is keeping the, all the electrical systems supplied, and I've already paid the money for it, I may as well set up the primary flight display and the flight plan before we start the engine. So let's do the PFD first of all. Now, a lot of this will be personal preference. Again, we'll just set it up going from left to right. So on the inset map, I prefer it to be decluttered as much as possible. And I prefer to have the terrain display rather than topographic display and zoomed out to about 15. And that gives me terrain awareness and flight path awareness. On the PFD, um, we've got synthetic vision turned on. Um, I've done about probably 130, 140 hours behind the G1000 in real life, and I never had synthetic vision. Um, wasn't too sure what to make of it initially, but one of the really useful features of having synthetic vision turned on is the enhanced pitch scale here. If I turn it off momentarily, you'll see that 10 degrees is around about the midpoint here. You can see 20 degrees of pitch. But if I go into synthetic vision, it basically expands the pitch scale, which gives me a more sensitive uh, pitch scale, which is really quite useful. Wind, I prefer to have option three. We'll put the bearing pointers on, the, uh, the DME on, the bearing pointers on. And I'll make sure the uh, number two bearing pointer is pointing towards the GPS. That'll be important for the departure. We're in hectopascals, which is correct for the UK. Uh, I'm not gonna use the OBS mode. That was from a previous flight. CDI is selected to the GPS and the transponder is uh, VFR and standby. So that kind of makes sense. That's the PFD setup complete. Now, I also want to load the flight plan because there's no sense in burning gas while we are uh, trying to load the flight plan. I'll just turn the panel light on to make it a bit easier to see. The G1000 uh, without the text entry panel, I can't remember the Garmin exact name for it here, but without the keypad, uh, the G1000 is a real hassle. You want to have pretty much everything set up before you go flying because data entry takes a lot of time. You've, your head's down for quite a bit of time with it. The text pad here makes it a lot quicker, uh, a lot more intuitive. So let's walk through loading the flight plan. I'll bring up the flight plan screen. Again, this is something else. So let's delete what we have previously. And we've got Glasgow to Glasgow. So I said, we're going to go to Aberdeen. I'm going to push the uh, end of the FMS knob there and I'll put Aberdeen EG PD. Aberdeen. Okay. Now I need to load the actual route I'm going to take as well. So I'm going to fly an instrument departure that will take me to the Perth VOR, that's PTH. And then I'm going to select the next waypoint after Perth, menu, 
we'll go to load airway and we'll choose one of the two airways that goes through the Perth VOR. It's the P600 in this case and I'm going to go as far as the waypoint called Glesk. Enter, enter. So we've got the departure airport, the arrival airfield and the airways routing in the middle. That's quite straightforward. Now I need to load the instrument departure as well but we, before we do that one of the really useful things is the charting function. It can read charts uh, over the internet. It comes from a service called AutoRouter, I believe. But we can have a look at the instrument charts. This is the chart for the Perth uh, departure, uh, the departure that we're planning to use. We're going to get airborne off runway 23 at Glasgow, fly ahead on the GAU radial 226 to a waypoint called Zeton. We're going to turn right and intercept course 046 towards a waypoint called Elban, making sure we're above 2500 feet by the GAU radial 298. There's a little wiggle in here and then out towards Perth and the stop altitude is 6000 feet. So that seems quite straightforward. It's the Perth 4 Alpha departure. So I'll go back to my flight plan. I'll push the procedure button. We'll select the departure and we'll pick the Perth 4 Alpha. We'll load it straight onto the flight plan and looking through it here now we have got runway 23 to 530 feet to Zeton and then above 2500 feet on the crossing radial stopping at Elban 6000 feet. So that looks like a fairly sensible departure. We'll configure the flight guidance uh, to make sure that works as well. So we're going to stop at an altitude of 6000 feet. The, the initial heading when we get airborne is around about 230 degrees. It's important that we do not put the G1000 into heading mode on the ground. What we can do though is push the toga button on the side of the power lever and that gives me takeoff, takeoff FMAs with out select 6000. So it's going to maintain wings level 10 degree pitch attitude to 6000 feet. I'm going to tell it that I would rather use nav mode so GPS is now armed in white. That should help it capture the track. That's the departure and the en route uh, flight plan sorted out. Because we're single pilot IFR, I'm going to load the full uh, arrival information into the flight plan as well so that I don't have to do it when I'm airborne. So again, procedure. An Aberdeen, it doesn't have a standard instrument uh, arrival. It only has the approach. We're going to fly the ILS approach to runway 34. So select approach, ILS, 3-4, we're going to go via Glesk because that was the final waypoint we had on the on-route flight plan. We can put the minimums in as well, it's going to be barrow minimums of 420 feet. Enter and load. Make sure we load that and we don't activate it. So one final check on the, the flight plan. We've got the departure all the way out to Perth, we've got an airways routing and we've got the approach into Aberdeen. We're going to check our FMAs again. We've got runway 23 to 530 feet, that's the correct leg to start off on. We've got takeoff initially with GPS armed and we're going to stop at altitude of 6,000 feet. So at this point we would have to get our air traffic control clearance. Part of that would be the transponder code and they'd confirm the departure routing as well. Let's say that we've got a transponder code of uh, 4651. You'll see that crop up in quite a few Reflected Reality Simulations video. That was the transponder code on my first ever powered solo in an aircraft. That's just why it always seems to crop up there. So we've done the flight plan. We're ready to start the engines. It's quite straightforward although everything tends to happen a little bit quickly. So we'll talk through the process first of all. Firstly, I've already done the lights check, so that's fine. I'm going to put the displays into the display backup mode that shows the same information on all three screens. If we didn't do that, we'd be relying on the MFD for the engine start. But as I demonstrated at the beginning, only this screen is fed directly from the battery. So if we have a power interruption during the start, and I want to keep the engine safe, it's by far the most expensive component on the aircraft. I need to be able to see what's going on. So that's why we use the display reversion. 
have a check outside, make sure that we've taken everything out that we need to. I'm going to leave the chocks in uh, for the engine start, simply because we've got a ground power car in front of us. We don't want to, to drive into that. So if the brakes are not holding, the chocks will hold us instead. Display reversion is done. We'll call air traffic for clearance to start. And we'll put the transponder to on or to out. That way air traffic can see us on the ground movement radar. We don't have a rotating beacon, so I'll put the strobe lights on. And I'll also put the fuel pump, the aux fuel pump, to on. Verify that we've got ignition to auto and then we are ready to consider the start. So I'm going to bring up the timer panel here. I've got the start, stop and reset mapped onto a joystick button, just the same as it's on the real aircraft timer over here. The process is going to be start the timer and hold the start switch to start for two seconds. We're going to verify starter, ignition and main gen on the CAS. We're going to check the ITT is less than 150 degrees make sure the NG is above 13% and then we're going to move the power lever from idle cutoff to low idle. Again, I've got keystrokes to move the power lever here. Okay, so seems straightforward. Let's give it a go. I'm going to go on the starter, on and start the timer. We say we've got starter, ignition, main gen, ITT less than 150, Starter above 13, power lever to low idle. We'll monitor the ITT on the startup and we're looking for 30% by 30 seconds. ITT is good, 30% by 30 seconds. Keeping an eye on the ITT, we're now looking for 50% by 60 seconds. It's a good start. ITT is unwinding and we've got uh, approximately 56%. So we'll leave it in low idle for the time being. I'll reset the source. Sorry, we should have dis I just double checked that the starter has disconnected on the cast as well. We'll bring the source selector to battery. And then we can tell the ground crew that we are finished with the GPU. And we're finished with the chops. Once the GPU is disconnected, you'll see GPU door disappear. The vicinity of the aircraft's clear. So let's bring the power lever up to flight range. Having done that, we'll put the inertial separator on and we're going to select the boost pump from on to auto. You hear the noise go off, that's because the engine driven pump is running. So the propeller is unfeathering nicely. So we'll continue across here. We've done the boost pump to auto. Fuel selector also goes to auto. You see at the moment it's on the left tank. I'm going to push the shift button and make sure it moves to the right tank, which it does. And check it again, make sure it goes back to the left. I'm also going to put the AP trims switch to on. There's a bing just to tell us the separator is running. And we're probably finished with the display reversion now. So, we've done everything on the overhead panel, we've done the initial separator. The last thing we've got to do before we do uh, too much, uh, the next thing we've got to do before we go too much further is check the generator. So on the system page, I'll bring up the ELEC page. The main generator is producing less than 80 amps, that's fine, that means we can do the generator check. And the voltage here is 28.5, that's perfect. So let's switch on to the standby generator. We get a caption for the main gen. You see the standby generator is providing 18 amps and the voltage is sensible. So the standby generator is working correctly. Back to main. And that's us finished with the generator check. Having done that, we can put the bleed on and we'll put the AC to auto. So the aircraft is certified for flight in icing conditions. We've got to check the de-icing systems work before we rely on that. So that's quite straightforward. We'll switch the propeller de-ice and the windshield de-ice on. I'm also going to bring the 
NG up to around about 80%. As I bring the power up, I'm just going to make sure that we're not moving. So there's 80% and I'm going to click the airframe ice on. Looking for the green light and the boots inflating. And the next green light should indicate the inner boots. So there's the second green light and the inner boots. I'm going to leave that to do a full cycle. It'll take about 60 seconds from now. I'll leave the uh, NG where it is. We've got to check the trims as well. So let's bring the yoke back. We're checking not only that the trims move, we've got elevator, rudder and aileron trim. But as well as checking the trims move, we're also checking that the autopilot disconnect button will interrupt the trims. So if I hold the trim nose down and push the disconnect, the trim stops moving. Likewise, nose up, disconnect, trim stops moving. Same with yaw and same with the aileron. So having done that, we'll make sure that the trims are centered and the rudder is just slightly to the right of center. That's the trim check complete. We need to do a flight control check as well, but I'll finish the de-icing checks and then we can move on to the flight controls. So there we go, there's the light for the outers. And again, we've got the light for the inner boots. So the de-icing system is working correctly. I'll select airframe ice off. I'll come back to flight idle. I'll select propeller ice and windshield ice off. Now we're back to idle, I'll do a flight control check. We'll only do the uh, elevator and ailerons. We'll do the rudder check during the taxi. And I also need to do a feather check to make sure the propeller can feather. So we're at flight idle at the moment. Keep an eye on the prop here. And I'm going to move the power lever from flight idle to high idle. Make sure it feathers. I'm back to flight idle. And we'll do it one more time. Excellent. So we've done a generator check, which is on the top. We've come down here. We've done an icing check, a flight control check, a trim check, and then the feather check. So everything is ready to go. Before we move off, I'll show you the uh, power lever versus the joystick. So what is indicated by this uh, outline here is my physical joystick position and the H pattern is the power lever. It won't go below flight idle until I click the reverser button momentarily and that gets me into the taxi range. So I'll bring it back to mid taxi range. We'd obviously get air traffic clearance to taxi off. I'll put the tax light on Quick check on both the left and the right sides, obviously double checking those fuel caps are on. We'll release the brakes. And a very quick check of the brakes. Now we're moving. My rudder pedals have long since stopped working, so I've got a push button for normal braking effort and a twist grip for the rudder. Taxing out for runway 23 at Glasgow. If you've been flying heavier aircraft, you'll notice that I'm taxiing with the flaps up rather than having the flaps out. With an airliner, it's normal to taxi with the flaps out. So we've got a big propeller on the front of this aircraft. Any gravel or grit that's hanging around on the taxiway, um, if we had the flaps out, they would be in prime position to be hit by the uh, any debris thrown up by the propeller. So very normal to taxi with the flaps up on a single engine aircraft. As we come around the corner there as well, you may have noticed the FMA went from takeoff to GPS. That's simply because we got close enough to the desired track that it uh, it was able to engage the GPS mode. That's fine. Now, on the taxi out, there's only two little things to do. So I'll make sure we're in a straight line. I'll change the page here to be the traffic map. I'll put that to operate. And I'll go to weather radar on the next page, mode and standby and you can actually hear the radar scanner move in this aircraft. It's on the uh, left wing out there. And that's it. 
We'll do everything else at the holding position. So we've got the power lever, as I said, in the taxi range, we're able to regulate the speed quite adequately. 10 to 20 knots is fine on the taxi out. As I said, you can get the, uh, the real manuals for this aircraft online quite easily, and it's got everything you need to know about the aircraft in there. So I'm going to use the full length of the runway. We're going to cross, uh, cross the Cat 3 hold and stop at the Cat 1 hold. It's hold Alpha 1. You see that it's only nine minutes since the engine was started. It feels like the de-ice checks and everything else takes a fair bit of time. In reality, you can get the aircraft ready to taxi uh, within about three or four minutes, having done all the checks once you're fairly slick with it and you're not doing it slowly to, to explain it. So here's the Alpha 1 hold for runway 23. I'll just bring the aircraft to a halt. Set the parking brake, reset to fly idle, and cancel the master warning for the parking brake. We'll get the aircraft ready to take off. I'll put the pitot heaters and the stall heaters on, flaps to take off, and I'll put the, uh, the lights to landing lights on. Double check it, left to right, and we'll go bottom to up in this case, so bottom to top. Check we've got the pitot heaters and the inertial separator on for the de-icing. Flaps are takeoff, trims are sensible, CAS is checked, we've got the separator on, which is fine. Battery amps are less than 50, that's fine. Transponder is out, FMAs are sensible, stopping at 6,000 feet, course pointer is selected, and the lights and the strobes are on. We're ready for takeoff. Get clearance to line up and wait. I'll take the brake off, come back into the taxi range, and move forward. Now Glasgow's a very long runway, and this aircraft has got no auto thrust whatsoever. You can damage the engine by over torquing it, so we need to be careful with the power setting. You're looking for 100% torque, but realistically 95-96 is fine, and on a long runway like this, if I only got to 93-94, I wouldn't be overly concerned. When we get airborne, we're going to concentrate on flying up to the pitch attitude of 10 degrees. We're going to gently touch the brakes and then retract the gear. And then we're not going to touch anything until at least 500 feet above the field. So, holding on the brakes, takeoff clearance is received. We're going to bring the torque up to about 50%, making sure that the propeller RPM comes into the green. Release the brakes and then smoothly apply power looking for 95 to 100%. Rotation speed is just below 90 knots at the weight we're at today. So there's 80 and rotate. Smoothly up to 10 degrees. Quick dab of the brakes. Gear up. Follow the flight directors. Now, 500 feet. I'm just going to fly slightly under the flight directors, just momentarily. They're also commanding quite a turn to the right. I'm going to ignore that. So I can see the deviation bar just coming in. And once we get to 115 knots, I'll just ease back on the power there. Once we get to 115 knots, I'm going to select Flaps up. Flaps up. I'm going to put the yaw damper on. Autopilot in. And flight level change. I'm going to look for 124 knots. 
that's their best rate of climb. So your damper, autopilot and flight level change, they're all buttons I've got on the joystick. Now, we're climbing towards Zeton here. If I was in an airliner, I'd expect to be doing uh, about 200 knots at Zeton. In this aircraft, I'm, I'm going to demonstrate at 124. Now the MSA, the minimum safe altitude at Glasgow is around about 4,000 feet. I'd be quite happy to accelerate here. That would give me a bigger radius of turn. But I'm going to keep the speed back just to demonstrate uh, this uh, particular gotcha on the G1000 here. Note that because I'm doing a best rate of climb, that we are quite close to the alpha limit on the aircraft. So we'll just be aware of that. Rooting down towards Zeton, hopefully Glasgow Tower would have handed us over to Scottish. We'd get a frequency change, obviously, and a climb to flight level. So let's say we're going to climb to flight level 150. 150, push barrow, we've got standard, alt select flight level 150. Now remember, after Zeton, we're going to turn right and intercept course 046 towards Elban. Let's see what the aircraft does. Here's the turn. CDI is leading us round, which is fine. Still got a green bar showing on the uh, Alpha. That's okay. I'm aware we've still got the inertial separator, but we'll deal with that once we've dealt with the turn. Now, we check the FMAs. It's taking us from Zeton to that crossing waypoint. Remember, that's above 2,500 feet. We're way above that already. What's important to note is that the aircraft is going to fly a 30 degree intercept onto that inbound track, which is okay. But because it's doing that, remember we've got the number two course pointer looking at the current GPS waypoint. So the waypoint is on the left hand side of the aircraft and we're flying to the right. Looking on the MFD here, L band's up here and we're going to fly a track roughly like this. That means we're going to miss out on the D299 echo here. That would be a bad thing but it's easy to fix. Let's go into the flight plan page, scroll down towards LPAN, menu, and activate leg. And you'll see that the two waypoint is now LPAN. It hasn't changed the course, it's still the same intercept, but it means that we will intercept the course correctly. I could have flown the departure faster and that wouldn't have been an issue. I could have reduced the bank angle with the bank button and that wouldn't have been an issue. Let's get rid of that separator and we'll start accelerating. So the torque's below 80% and we'll turn the inertial separator off. I'm not going to move the power lever, but as the inertial separator is uh, turned off, it allows the engine to breathe a little bit better, which means the torque's going to come up. I'm also going to vertical speed mode and I'll lower the nose to around about 1,000 feet a minute to allow us to accelerate. Let's keep a close eye on the torque. You see it's increasing as the separator retracts. If it goes to 100, I'm going to have to bring the power back a little bit. There we go. I always use 95% just to give me some margin there. I'm also going to push the heading knob here to synchronize the uh, heading bug onto the current heading. You see it went way inside that Delta 299 Echo waypoint. It's going to get to Elban, fly that jink, and then out towards Perth. So approaching flight level 100, I'm going to check that we are pressurizing. That's fine. No cast messages. The inertial separator is off and we'll turn the landing lights off as well. As we approach 170 knots, I'm going to get ready to change over to flight level change. So Slight level change and we'll climb the remaining distance or the remaining altitude at 170 knots. As I'm climbing I've got to keep nudging the power lever forward because the torque will drop off as we gain altitude. But it's important to keep the ITT in your scan as well as you're bringing the power up 
you want to keep the ITT below 790 for continuous operation. It's in the turn here, we can see Loch Lomond, and we can see Loch Lomond on the synthetic vision display as well. The developers have done a really good job at getting the synthetic vision uh, overlaid on the G1000. As I said, I've spent a lot of time behind the G1000, almost all VFR work on a, an earlier model of the G1000 um, with the uh, smaller multifunction display and no synthetic vision. Synthetic vision is absolutely fantastic. So look at the torque drop off without the ITT changing. As I increase the power lever setting, note that the ITT comes up and there's going to come a changeover point around about 20,000 feet or so that we can no longer get 100% torque because we'll be into ITT limits. We've still got a little bit to go until that point though. So the aircraft's completed the turn. It's now flying uh, out towards Perth. There's another little wiggle it's got to do here. And that's because this uh, airfield here is Strathallan. It's a parachute dropping airfield. So the departure takes us just out of the overhead there. So wings level, synchronize the heading, double check the fuel is in balance, check the torque. It's important to always check the fuel is in balance. As I said, this uh, fuel tank selector, unlike a Cherokee or a, a Piper, this will uh, change automatically, but it changes on a timer rather than to balance the tanks. So if you spent uh, all of your cruise time or your, your climb power on the left-hand tank and then your cruise power on the right-hand tank, you'll find that you'll be slightly out of balance. So if necessary, push the shift button to keep the fuel tanks in balance. So torques drop back to 91. Again, I'll increase it just a little bit further. Note the ITD comes up, but still below 790. So as I said, there's no automatic thrust on the aircraft. You've always got manual control of the power. When we level at flight level 150, uh, we could simply leave the power setting where it is and the aircraft would accelerate. But it's a fairly short flight and I'd probably slow down a little bit just to buy myself some time. And also it gives us a chance to look at the fuel endurance on the aircraft as well. I tend to do flight plan management on the uh, MFD and any immediate changes I do on the PFD. You don't have to do it that way, it's just the way I prefer to do it. So looking at this, it's got up to flight level 150, about 20 minutes after starting the engine, which is, is very good. So today, as we level off, I'm going to bring the torque back with the power lever. There we go, we've got uh, out select captured. I start bringing the torque back and I'm going to look for around about 60 gallons an hour. There we go, good capture at flight level 150. Now 60 gallons an hour is one gallon a minute obviously, it makes the maths really easy. We're also going to end up cruising at just over four miles a minute. So if we have a look on the fuel system page, so system, fuel, it shows me how much my fuel remaining is, 275. So 250 times five would be a thousand. We've got about 1,100 miles until tanks dry, and that's at a very low altitude cruise. So the range estimates for the aircraft, uh, the fuel performance is, uh, is very much by the book. Now in three miles we'd get to that uh, wiggle to intercept the next radial down towards Perth, but hopefully the Scottish air traffic controllers would be uh, would look favourably on us and we get a shortcut instead. So I'll push the flight plan button here, choose ASNAD, push direct and enter, and that gives me a shortcut through the overhead, no para dropping today, and it keeps me just inside controlled airspace. We'll talk about the UK airspace structure in one of the later videos. But suffice to say that 
most of the airspace uh, in the UK outside of uh, airway routings is Class G airspace, completely uncontrolled, unlike Class E that you would have in the US. So that's us in the cruise. The last thing we really need to do is to bring up the flight plan. And for the sake of this video, let's say that I want to be at Glesk at flight level 90. So I'll put flight level 90 in at Glesk. Make sure I push the enter button. I'll go on to VNAV profile and I'll tell the aircraft that I would like to fly a three degree profile. That tells me I've got about nine minutes until top of descent. So what we'll do is we'll finish this video now. We had a look at the departure, uh, having started the aircraft up using the GPU. We recognised the importance of maintaining FMA awareness on the G1000. And we realised that we have to continually monitor the torque and the ITT on the departure. The next video will complete the flight with the ILS approach into Aberdeen, runway 34. Thanks very much for watching. Always check the video description to see if there's any errors and omissions in there. If you do have any questions or comments, please feel free to put them in the comment section below. And I do hope you'll tune in again for the next video in the series. Thanks very much for watching.